Welcome to the Hirschberg Foundation for Pancreatic Cancer Research webinar, Conversation and Coaching with Pancreatic Cancer Survivors, Marissa Harris and Wendy Hammers. My name is Amy Reese, and I'm the Patient and Family Support Coordinator for the Hirschberg Foundation. Aggie Hirschberg, our founder, is here too, and looks forward to saying hello at the end of the webinar. First, I'd like to acknowledge all of our wonderful sponsors who help make these webinars possible, including Celgene, Novacure, and Fibrogen. Please ask your questions either during or after the slide presentation, in this case, a conversation, by clicking on the chat button at the bottom of the screen and type and submit your question. We will open the discussion for all after the presentation. This webinar is being recorded and will be made available on our website, pancreatic.org. Today, we welcome back two inspirational women, Marissa and Wendy. Marissa transformed her life after being diagnosed with stage four pancreatic cancer in 1998, 22 years ago. In her quest to heal from this disease and take control, she became certified in mind-body medicine. Now as a master integrative coach, she supports cancer patients in achieving their personal goals with health and wellness. Wendy is a five-year survivor who connected with coach Marissa early in her treatment and found their sessions priceless. Wendy is a multi-hyphenate, actress, writer, speaker, storyteller, and more. I went on her website recently and smiled when I read, hey, hey, Wendy Hammer's here, audacious, curvaceous, alive, and well. That says it all. Both are busy living extraordinary and full lives, yet give back to the community consistently. And we are so grateful to have them with us today on World Pancreatic Cancer Day 2020. Thank you, Marissa and Wendy. The floor is yours. So hello, everybody. I'm Marissa Harris, and I'm in New York City. Uh, it's cold and uh, windy outside. So um, I'm a little hoarse. Say hi. I'm Wendy Hammers, and I'm not in a cold weather. I'm here in Mexico in Sea of Cortez, and I'm bringing all the beautiful sunshine of our 90 degree weather here to all of you today. Yeah. So I may sound a little hoarse because I, right now I'm on Zoom doing sessions or on the phone pretty much seven, eight hours a day. Um, I'm absolutely delighted to be here. And before um, I'm going to, before I do an interview with Wendy so that she could share the highlights of her experience, the ups and downs and the lessons learned, uh, just a little bit more and, and life coach. I had spent uh, two decades in corporate America as head of human resources. And my uh, claim to fame was taking uh, organizations and individuals from a mediocre and even less than a mediocre position to number one, uh, either in the organization or number one worldwide. And, uh, and then at the height of my career, I get diagnosed with stage four pancreatic cancer and told that there's nothing that can be done. And that if I'm really, really lucky, I have nine months to live. And that diagnosis and prognosis just set in motion a chain of events uh, that changed my whole way of looking at myself, at looking at others, at looking at the world. And not only uh, did I decide to use this business success model and apply that had worked for organizations and individuals and apply it to this uh, diagnosis, um, but I decided also to share it with people who sat in the chemotherapy room with me um, and added this emerge not only that I'm alive today, but also uh, a career, an extraordinary coaching career where I've had the privilege of, of meeting the most wonderful people um, who like me faced a serious diagnosis of cancer. And so today I have the chance to reunite with an extraordinary woman who I coach, uh, Wendy Hammers. So Wendy, let's go back in time. It's, uh, let's go back even before you came, well, you didn't come to see me, before we were uh, doing our sessions by phone, which was, I think the first session was September 14th, 2015. Mm -hmm. 
But even before that, you're, you were a wife, you were a mother of uh, a teenage girl that I think was just wife. about to go off to wife. college, right? Right. Yeah. And you, yeah. Right. And you had this uh, career that you were very dedicated to being an actress and storyteller and stand up comics. So, what was it like for you when you got that diagnosis? Um, I think the very first reaction I had, since I tend to be an optimist and I tend to think be the best case scenario, is I just assumed cancer was something that happened to other people. So when I first got the diagnosis, um, I was told that it was, they didn't know yet if it was benign or malignant, they knew there was something there. I was so unfamiliar with the world of cancer that I didn't know which was the good one, benign or malignant. I, I seriously didn't know. Um, but I said, well, he said, well, no, in a week. And I, I, I really don't know what to tell you yet, but we'll find out. And I just assumed, oh, well, this is something that happens to other people. So I guess my first reaction and answer your question was some sort of denial. I didn't think it was possible for me to get cancer. Mm -hmm. It just was like, that's not what I'm going to do here. Um, I felt I had a higher calling. And as you said, a teenage son, wonderful marriage, a, a career and traveling the country and as a comedian and an actress. And I, I just thought this isn't going to happen. And then I got the diagnosis. And I guess the very first thought from there was probably um, I had some concerns about the people around me. I thought of my husband and my mm -hmm. son and how they would, how this would be for them. I think the idea oh. of how it would be for me was so big, I didn't even look at that initially. It's just kind mm -hmm. of a denial and kind of going, okay, well, and then I you know, came around to figuring out that I did in fact have it and I had to go into solution. But I didn't know what that was going to look like yet. Right. Yeah. So then you heard a webinar and you heard me speak. I did. What um, caused you? You were, you called me immediately. You were the first person uh, that called me and a number of people called me, but you were the one who, not with easy circumstances, but you decided you were going to work with me and make that happen. So what prompted you to do that? because you were had a positive message and you were a survivor and you were at the bottom of the bell curve. You were somebody who had defied the odds and those were all things I was interested in. Um, and I think, you know, I, I say in my, my show uh, that I, I think that when people hear you have cancer because you're a woman, they assume it's breast cancer, which is no day at, at the beach, but they give you the breast cancer face, which is sort of like this compassion, like, oh, and then when people find out you have pancreatic cancer, mm -hmm. they look like they're going to die. They look like they're in shock. And they're just that people literally said to me, oh, isn't that the one that's supposed to kill you? I'm like, uh, thanks a lot. So uh, I went from. Uh, so what's your question? So ask me your question again. I'm going to make sure I answered. What prompted question. you to be that person who picked up the phone right away and, uh, and called me? Uh, Everyone had my contact information, but you called me because I was interested in the solution. And I felt like you were a person who had done what people said wasn't possible. And I knew that I was gonna do what needed to be done so that I could continue to stay here because I really wanted to be alive. And so I, I do remember um, reaching out to you and I was so thrilled because first I looked at your, I think I went to your website and then I saw your phone number and I was gonna email you. And I thought, you know what? This woman just reached out across the airwaves much like you and I are doing today in this symposium. And um, I wanted you to know how much you touched my heart and how grateful I was that there was somebody yeah. on the other end. And so I said, hi, I just left this message on what I thought was maybe even your home machine. I wasn't sure where I called. I said, hi, um, listen, I just want you to know, I do a lot of speaking in my life and you put things out in the world and you don't know where it lands. And I want you to know you were received 3000 miles away. I'm in LA, you're in New York and you touched my heart and I'm just so grateful. And then you called me back and then you said you would work with me on the phone for an hour. And I just couldn't believe your generosity. I was blown away. And I took you up on that as well. Because again, I wanted to go towards the solution. And I have more to say about that, but, I, but I'll, I'll, we'll continue that. But, but I, it was one very specific thing about when I got sick and people said, what do you need? And I remember my answer was, I need good news. I need positive mm -hmm. stories. If you know anyone who survived pancreatic cancer, I want their phone number. If you know anybody who has bad things to say or had a negative experience, um, I'm, I never need to hear about it because while I'm in the middle of this process, that won't be helpful to me. And that's how right. I dealt with it. Right. And, um, you know, and I just want to say for uh, everyone listening, 
Wendy did not get these questions. She didn't know what I was going to ask um, because I wanted this to be, uh, I wanted this to be authentic and very real in, in this moment. Um, so we spoke about that. I asked you about um, forming a, a team, a, uh, a team of believers. And, and you said to me, well, what does that mean? And I said, well, it means, you know, having people and being the CEO of this, that you're in charge of this, being very clear that if you're going to be on my team, you have to believe that I will and I can get well again. Mm -hmm. So I, just share it. And that's not so easy because it's You asked made, me the question more than once. You asked yeah. me and then I answered it. And then you said, no, I want you to really answer it. Like really be sure you feel this way. I said, no, I'm committed to getting better. I'm committed to doing whatever I need to do to participate in my own healing and to be open to receiving information that will help me do that. Yeah, pretty basic. So how did you deal with those people who, oh my gosh, it's pancreatic cancer. Isn't that the worst cancer? Or, you know, and people that may even have been close friends or families, how did you redirect uh, them? I think I put up like a force field. I like, cause that really good boundaries. I told people that, um, first of all, I didn't do a lot of talking to people on the phone. I didn't, I, I, I mean, I, I remember at one point I had like 4,000 emails that I'd never looked at. I just was like, I'm not going there. I was going to go inward. You told me early on not to, um, not to know that I was not allowed to watch CNN, but you said that was not that the CNN that we all know it was stood for constantly negative news. I knew that my body and my mind didn't have the bandwidth to handle the bad news and also focus on recovery. And so I just thought, well, I'm, I'm working on this now, so I'm not gonna do that. So I guess the answer to the question is, I'm fortunate in that I had done enough work on myself in my life that I had weeded out a lot of negative people. And I didn't, I really had a lot of very good people in my life at the time, but anybody that felt like they could be draining me, I just, I just said, yeah, I'm, I'm doing this now. I'm, I'm taking, I just stepped away the best I could. And I did put two things in place. Um, I put, um, well, dear friends of mine did this for me. They put a meal train in place, which allowed people who wanted to um, donate food or help feed my family while I was work going through the treatment and was too weak to do anything. Um, so we did that. And then I had a Facebook page where people could, I, the Facebook page was helpful because it allowed people to have a place to communicate without me having to deal with the, doing it myself. If that makes any sense. So I didn't have to focus on it. Yeah, no, no, it's a way of absolutely giving your, said, yeah, because yeah, well, everything is energy. And um, if yeah. you're so busy answering all these emails and, you know, from well meaning people or whatever, then we don't have the energy to really do the most important things in terms of and increasing our uh, immune system yeah. and getting well. I have a dear friend who um, was at a diagnosis of lung cancer, uh, stage four lung cancer, about two months ago. And, you know, I was talking to her through this process, what we're talking about now. And I said, anybody that doesn't understand that you can't be there for them isn't your friend anyhow. If, if they can't get that you're going through a cancer treatment and that you need to be doing that, then that's not somebody that you need to have around. I mean, I, maybe that sounds cruel, but that felt very real to me. Right. Yeah. And there are ways of doing it. So one of my dearest friends, um, when I decided I was going to do chemotherapy and she was on that side of that's going to kill you or that's going to, you know, yeah. um, and I said to Jane, I said, I love you. Um, but if you can't sub com completely support what I'm doing, I'm not saying that this is what you're supposed to do. If God forbid you ever got diagnosed, but there is a way of saying it, but you know, are you willing to authentically support what I'm doing. And in one second, that changed. And she said, Marissa, I absolutely support the choices that you make. But this is really important in terms of that. And, you know, and also extending that to uh, who you choose to be your oncologist. Uh, so that initially I had oncologists who could only believe that I was going to die. And I knew that I couldn't stay with a doctor, mm -hmm. no matter how, uh, you know, no matter how 
his, you know, that his, his experience and his reputation, you know, was of the highest. He was the most in demand, but he only wanted to see me as the person who was dying. And so one of the steps that's so important, and I share this with you because this is important for everyone, is to find a medical team, an oncologist who believes in what I was looking for, in the possibility that I could get well again. I yeah. certainly wasn't going to ask for a guarantee, um, but, but and that was my question until I found that oncologist. Do you and believe that there's a possibility? Yeah. Right. So I want to, you really instilled that in me. I can still mm -hmm. hear your voice very specifically. Mm -hmm. One of the first lessons you said to me, you must love your doctors and they must love you. It was so simple. And I went to a nutritional oncologist, which is a person who specializes in doing health and nutrition, but it works in conjunction with traditional medical procedure and chemo and all of that. And I could feel myself getting ill, more ill in her presence. Mm -hmm. As I was there in the office, oh, I, I did not feel well. I didn't feel her way. Of, I, she was clearly knowledgeable. She had a lot of information. And I left that office and I knew she wasn't my doctor. And I called and I told them, that, you know, we weren't going to continue. And they gave me a refund. And because they had, she had given me all of this Anyhow, I, I just listened. That was the beginning of my recovery was to be able to trust my body and my instincts. And that's going to be important for anybody going through this journey is to really right. listen to not only the doctors that you put on your team, but your inner voice and your own sense of what is needed for you to be able to do this process. Right. So I want to go back to my CNN instruction. Don't yeah. pay attention. Don't put your attention on constantly negative news. And I mean, right now, I would say to people, especially over the last week, don't listen to CNN or anything because it's so negative. But what I really meant with Wendy um, was if you're to change the, the channel. So I said, you know, you have a remote. Everybody has a remote control. Um, and that when you notice that your thinking is constantly negative news, you want to change that. You want to take that remote control and say, nope, I'm going to the discovery channel. I'm going to the <laughs> love channel. I'm going to the health you know, channel. So this is going to take us into the next question. I want to tell you um, that I, I went to the Marissa channel. And a lot of times I used to use an excuse when people would say, oh my God, I'm so sorry. How do you feel? Are you scared? I would say, actually, I'm working with a coach and she was diagnosed 22 years ago and she's fine. So I think I'm good. And then they would shut them up. <laughs> right. Exactly. exactly. At, the time, at the time it was like 18 years, which was still unheard of, you know. So and that take takes me into my uh, next question. So I don't know if you remember, but that um, one of our early sessions, I said to you, so what's your vision, Wendy? What would you love? Like it's, and I think I use, um, I think I use two years from now because three years. I, w three years. I gave you three years. Okay. I sometimes give people two years, so I gave you three years. Because um, I think you were so busy in your life, I thought. Of <laughs> but anyhow, what was your vision? Yeah, and just what was your, what would you love more than anything else in terms of your health? What would you, and I'm going to just, and then we went to every area of your life because our level of enjoyment, of satisfaction, of ease, whether it be in our relationships, whether it being the work that we really find meaning of, um, where we're living absolutely impacts the body and its ability uh, to get well again. Um, and it certainly impacts the quality of life. So do you remember the vision that you shared I want to share you around your health? Yeah, go ahead, go ahead. I, my memory of, of that whole conversation was this. You said it in such a delicious way. You said, and then remember, here I am, I'm newly diagnosed. I feel weak. I'm spending a lot of time in the bathroom because I had this lovely thing for those of you that are going through this might know what this is. It's called dumping syndrome, which basically every time I put something in my body, it wouldn't stay in my body. So I was having a very intimate relationship with the toilet. I was not feeling fantastic physically. And um, you and I got on the first call, I made it to the computer and you said, 
three years from now, you and I are going to get together in Manhattan and have some fabulous lunch somewhere. And at that lunch, you're going to tell me how the last three years of your life were the best years of your life. Mm -hmm. (laughs) It's Mm -hmm. unbelievable. Like most people go, oh yeah, maybe you'll get through pancreatic cancer. And then maybe if you get through it, maybe we could like see each other again. You're like, no, no, no. Not only are you going to survive, you're going to thrive. The vision was, you set the bar so high that it was like, well, you definitely could live, that's given. And your life is going to be more extraordinary than it was before you were sick, which has come to pass. And I, and you're like, so now tell me about what that's going to be like. And it kind of, my head went, woo. <laughs> now, right. My vision was that I would do the parts of my life that had been unattended to before I got sick. And it was mostly around my career. I knew I had a glorious marriage and a beautiful husband, a wonderful son, fantastic friends. I was blessed in so many ways. And yet I thought, well, why would I get sick? I'm doing a lot of the things that people usually say, if you do these things, you won't get sick. Or these, these are the things that people learn when they get cancer, they go, oh, now I'm going to enjoy my life and smell the roses and tell people that I care about that. I love them. I was already doing all of that. So I'm like, well, why did I get sick? What do I have to look at? And I thought, well, I'm not attending to my career. I have a vision of what I want to do with my work as an actor. And I feel like I haven't even started that. I put that on hold for 30 years of my life. And that the cancer woke me up and said, you need to look at this now. So my vision was to be really f- doing my life as an actress. That was my vision. And that's what I'm doing. Right. <laughs> but so I, just- cancer woke me up. It was like a big, you know, let me just say cancer, COVID, and many things we go through in life are pause buttons, forced pauses that make us or give us the opportunity to look and say, what do we want to look different after this? Right. So it's not about returning to the old life, but building a new life moving forward. Yeah, so I, I said to you, when I got diagnosed, I decided that pancreatic cancer was going to be my permission slip to live the life that I always longed to live. However, with me, I then just what came to me was, I don't even know what that would mean to live a life that I loved. I was so programmed to be responsible, to do what, you know, to be that responsible person in business, responsible person as a mother of three daughters, responsible person as a wife, as a member of a community or organization. So that was, so my permission slip to be as well, if I have that nine months and I intend to have much more than that, I'm gonna use it to really explore what's both uh, supporting that vision of getting well again and living a life in all areas that, that, that I love and what's, and what's sabotaging it. And I ask you a question about that, uh, which I remember very clearly because um, we did a lot of exploration about it, but I just want to emphasize one thing. And this comes out of 20 years in, uh, in HR and also in the world of positive psychology. Um, when I heard this for the first time, it didn't even make sense to me. But the principle is that you cannot get to your vision. You can only come from it. So my, Wendy not only told me what her vision is, I said, write it up to me, send it to me, I'll edit it. And she had some words, well, now I'm no longer have cancer. I said, no, get rid of cancer. It's just now I'm completely well and I'm dancing and I'm you know, doing all, all these things. Um, but I said, you're not going to, you're not going to use the power of vision when you get well, you want to start using it now. Yes. So I said to you, Wendy, I said, what would it mean if on the level of mind, on the level of mindset, everything begins first in mind. I got this this, this necklace in in Alaska. Um, Some artists had in mind, oh, I'm going to use these kinds of beads and this kind of arrangement, and it has a a beautiful clasp in the the back. Everything begins first in a thought, and it is very powerful. It's just as real as that which gets manifested in life. And I said to you, I said, what would it, would you be able, would you be willing to starting right now, be that woman that is already completely well, that can swim and hike and, and just, you know, and the body has never felt more healthy. Um, 
And that woman who has this amazing career, you know, that has, uh, that not only has really made it a priority in your life, uh, but that the fun and, and the spirit in which you're doing it is just at the highest level. So do you remember doing that? I do. Um, I do. And I remember that, well, not remember, but I guess my takeaway from that was there was so much focus on honoring that vision and living in the, I am well now and moving forward that it did not leave a lot of space for me to be afraid of mm -hmm. the process I was going through. I mean, it kind of, that's what I was focused on. I was focusing on, I'm going to have this extraordinary life that begins now and will continue to grow. And then this, what we, you taught me to use the word circumstance as opposed to cancer. Um, you have the circumstance right now and you're going to get through the circumstance and then you're going to have the rest of your life. And so that propelled me, it gave me energy, psychic energy, emotional, physical energy to move through it. Um, yeah. So going back to the CNN, the constantly negative news, I mean, you know, the, the, the diagnosis of cancer is because they're seeing something in the body. And also we know uh, that without, without this body, you know, I mean, without this, when I say body, I mean, you know, the, from the head all the way down, if that all is gone, it's really hard to have, is it possible actually? to have a, a great life. You, so you need to really honor and take care of the body. And we talked about, in terms of so she's CNN, what is your uh, relationship with your body? How do you feel about your body? How, is it, how, how have you felt about your body in the, over the last two decades? And Wendy, what did you share with me? I shared with you that my body, as much as I have wanted to love it, was had been a challenge for me for much mm -hmm. of my life. So I had struggled with my weight, like many women and many American women do. I had a big challenge with my body for most of my life. Um, not when I was a young child, but from the time I was in mm, high school. Mm -hmm. um, and I had a lot of shame around my body. I was, first I was short and flat chested and skinny and I was a gymnast. Um, and then I remember the first time that my gym coach told me that I needed to lose weight and I didn't even know I was overweight. And then the moment she said that, I'm not blaming her. I'm just aware. I remember it as a marker in time that I suddenly realized this body was something to not feel good about. And mm -hmm. I spent many decades wrestling with that and trying to have a relationship with this body, um, that was loving and kind. I did the gamut of diets. I did the 12 step program. Um, I also had, I, and I don't say this lightly, but it is part of my story. I also was molested when I was 21. Um, so I carried a lot of shame around that. I felt like I caused that, that mm -hmm. somehow, you know, if I had this beautiful body, then I, somebody wanted this body and that I could, so I had a lot of things that were weighing, no pun intended, weighing on me uh, uh, about my body. And now I was going to have to fall in love with this body because this body was going to save my life. I couldn't, I couldn't not like my body and also expected to want to live. <laughs> like I couldn't do both, but, you know? So that was a big, you know, I always said that the chemo killed the self-loathing. Like mm -hmm. when it took out the cancer, it also took out my truest ability to be unkind to myself. Right. It doesn't mean I don't have moments where I don't struggle with it. I do, but they're few and far between. And mostly I am aware that my body is extraordinary and beautiful and amazing. And yeah. Right, right, right. Now I remember, I remember this very well. We talked about deserving, well, deserving that great career or deserving this and, and, but my body, but I'm not the right weight. I'm not the right. Th mm -hmm. um, and uh, I love the thing about it. You know, the chemotherapy just took it out. I recently worked with someone with a different form of cancer, but a very serious, serious cancer. And, uh, um, and well, it was kidney cancer that had, but it had metastasized. But anyway, they, the kidney was just, they needed to get that kidney out um, because it was just not functioning anymore. And also poisons were coming out of that. And I said to her, I said, well, what if when they take that, because she, not unusual for women, had this, uh, hmm, this almost self-loathing 
about her about her body. Um, and I said, well, what if when they took that kidney out, all the loathing, all the messages that you've been getting went with that? And she said, okay, I'll do that. And does it mean that it never comes up again? But then she just remembers, like for you, that went with the chemotherapy. For her, it was that went with the the kidney. So we'll all have those things again. But if we have an, an image, a tool that we can work with, then we can bounce back. Yeah, um, a lot of women have issues with getting older. And I've always said, people are so worried about getting older, they should be more concerned with not getting older. Like right. getting older is way better. <laughs> so I think right. in terms of that too, I think if somebody say, oh, women, oh, well, what about my neck? My neck doesn't look right. And then right below my neckline, my clavicle, I have where my port was, where my medicine came in. So I have that little scar there, but it's a reminder that, oh, there was a time where my life was at stake. Like I had to do this thing and then now I, I'm good. So I, it looks beautiful to me now, but it took me a while to figure that out. Right, and we talk, you know, and it's also the thing about, you know, we, we know, I don't know how many of you on this call have pets or children, or I suppose even plants, yeah, definitely plants as well. But whatever you hate will hate you back. I mean, just, mm -hmm. you know, think of that having that, that puppy and the dog and you're just always, you know, yelling at it and, beating it up and whatever. And then you say, well, why doesn't that dog want to be with me or love me? Because you're sending out such hateful messages. Well, the same thing is true with our body, but it's also true, um, you know, with the treatments that we may be getting. And there, I mean, there's some tough treatments yeah. pancreatic cancer and it's not just one day in the chemo room or one time then you come home with right. this you know for some for those of you who get this kind of chemotherapy with this you know whooshing machine over the next 48 hours yeah, that's and, what i uh, had i had three days yeah, yeah right um, and yeah but i asked you initially what's your thoughts about the chemotherapy yeah so didn't want it. I was fine with the idea of surgery. It's so funny how some things yes, you scary to some people and other. I, I right. was hoping I was eligible for the Whipple procedure, which I was, which I did have. Um, and that was an eight hour procedure. And um, again, talking about the scars, I have a scar on my belly about that big. But, um, you know, I just remembered that the cancer is on the outside, like on the other side of the, of the scar. So that helps me with that. But um, so. But we, we, we worked with, your thoughts about, I don't want this cake, this, this chemotherapy. Oh, yeah. I was not and I, I said to you, <laughs> Wendy, whatever you dislike or hate is going to dislike and hate you back. Yeah. Can you find a way, in what way can you love this chemotherapy? What are some <laughs> thoughts that you can have? And do you remember, and you came, I mean, you know, you, you're a writer besides a, and, and everything else. And so you're good with words. But um, do you remember what you said, what you came up with? Um, no, I don't remember the specifics. You might. What I what I know is that I had to come to understand it was an elixir of life. It was something that was helping me. That's what it was. That's what it was. You, got, you do remember. You remember perfectly. That's what I said. I, I don't know if those are the words I used. Maybe I did. Um, well, it, I, I don't remember. I don't yeah. memorize the words you said, but that's exactly that's exactly what she said. I just want to ask you a question in terms of, of your son, because this comes up so often in my coaching mm -hmm. practice. Um, to just share with a group, you know, how was it for you to tell him tell him that's not an easy conversation for many people, his response, and how did you help him through this process? I didn't tell him the first week or two I had it. I think it might have been several weeks. I don't think it was a month. Um, my son Griffin, my only child who I'd raised, um, I, I'd gone through a divorce when uh, he was five years old. And at the time that I was diagnosed, he would have been a teenager for sure. Let's see if he's 23, he was 18 or 19 years old. He was about um, to go off to college, I think. Yeah, no, he was right. in his first year of college. He was a oh, he he okay. freshman. Uh, 
I, you know, when we talked earlier in this call about, you know, creating a team and surrounding yourself with a team of people that were on the same page with you, which is the page of that this is going to be a circumstance that's going to be temporary and that I'm going to get through this and come out the other side and have the rest of my glorious life on the other side of it. So uh, part of that was, that was my belief. And I shared with him. And I, I don't remember if you and I, you and I were already working together before I told him. I was working with you first. I, I guess what it was is I said to him, uh, I have this thing. They caught it early. The diagnosis is great. I have every confidence that I'm going to get better. That was how I felt. That's what I shared with him. So then people would say to me, how does your son doing with all this? And I said, you know, I think it would be most valuable if you ask him rather than ask me. So they would go to him and ask him, Griffin, how are you doing? And he said, you know, I would be scared, but my mom said she thinks she's going to be fine and I believe her, so I'm good. So again, I know that approach might seem very woo-woo or Pollyanna to people, but it really, in my heart, felt like that was my belief. I was honest with him. I said, um, you know, I never had anything like this. I didn't expect this to happen, but this is what we're dealing with. And I feel like I'm doing everything needed. I have a fantastic team of people that I trust and I'm going to be fine. And that's kind of how we dealt with it. And he was kind of amazing because right. right. he's amazing. And he would do things that he would have never done if I hadn't had cancer, like, you know, the dishes and laundry and crazy things like that. And then he, you know, he magically learned how to do them. <laughs> he probably won't like me saying that, but he did. He rose to the occasion. Uh, and my husband, they were extraordinary, quite extraordinary. And I've often said, uh, just on a sidebar to the caregivers listening on this call, in many ways, I think this is harder on the caregivers than it is on the people going through it. Not to say that it's easy, it's not. And not to say that I would wish this on anybody, I don't. But at least on any given day, I knew how I felt in my insides. But the people around me had to take my word for it and trust me. And it was scary for them, I think. Yeah, yeah, no, I, um, I a, a big part of my coaching practice is working with uh, uh, the spouses or sometimes it's, it's the children, sometimes yeah. it's, it's the mother. And in some ways it can be, uh, they're the forgotten people often. I mean, the, the person who has it gets more attention. And yet uh, even, you know, there's a place for all this work for the, for the caregiver uh, to create a vision, uh, to really look at your sense of deserving and what's standing in the way, um, you know, to create together uh, because, you know, for many people, um, certainly for me, there were a lot of changes I needed to make nutritionally. And uh, well, before you get into that, I want to say one thing that with my husband, who was incredibly supportive and kind and loving, but scared, more scared than my son, I had to course correct with him because he said to me, as I was going through chemo, and I was working with mm -hmm. you and I was doing all the things nutritionally and supplements. I was doing everything that made sense to me and I thought was right. He kept saying, the beginning this has got to work and i said mm -hmm. garth i'm going to stop you i want you to change your language and say this is working it wasn't like this like, sort of maybe perhaps this could work it wasn't something in like that it was like oh no it's working right now every right. day that i'm alive is a day that i am surviving already from my diagnosis i'm already right. in the solution i i, I and that's how i practiced it you know right and so, so we yeah. Yeah, we couldn't talk to me like that. <laughs> <That's all. laughs> we talked about that. I mean, because this is not, you know, you had some of your digestive issues. You had some of your oh fatigue. I mean, you had all the things and you, you know, some, we, and I would say to you, Wendy, I have one rule only, only as a coach. And that's you feel that you can be completely open and honest about what you're experiencing right now. Um, and you would, so you know, how are you doing? You just, you know, it's the day after you have that, that bag with you or whatever. And we would talk about the way again of reframing it, but in a way that's truthful that this is just the way it looks like as it's working itself out. It's part of that healing journey that you have that, you know, I couldn't, there were times where I couldn't even open my eyes, the, the yeah. fatigue. And I felt like I had cotton stuffed yeah. in my head. And also because it was 21 years ago, it was different kind of drugs. So I lost my eyelashes and my eyebrows and all my hair everywhere, everywhere. I, um, you know, but so it doesn't mean that, it, that, that there's some difficulties and challenges and things like, I don't want this, this doesn't feel good. 
but well, just to realize that this is exactly what it looks like and, and the way to recovery. Yeah. Is there any way in the middle of all of this, you can find humor and lightness, even in the absurdity of what you're going through. Uh, that to me, I feel like laughter has helped save, save my life for sure. Um, I do have a, I started laughing when you were talking at a very specific image just flashed through my mind just now of me having to wear, um, you know, depends mm -hmm. those adult mm -hmm. diapers. Okay. And I, now they make them all fancy. I'm kind of jealous when I watch the commercials. Now they're like have flowers on them and they're black, they're <laughs> sexy. I had horrible ones. And so I would roll them down and make them bikini style because I thought they looked sexier that way. I was convinced they did. Um, <laughs> so that was what I did. That was my, you know, I think also through the entire process, as you feel your pieces of yourself and your humanity are being ripped from you, you have to find ways, certainly I had to find ways to restore my own humanity and sense of myself as a woman and as a person. So if it made me feel good to put on a pretty scarf when I went to chemo or wear, wear a ball gown as I did uh, or whatever I did that got me through it because it made me feel like the part of me that I was wanting to restore, then I would do that. Absolutely. And you were just a a great um, model and inspiration for using, a, a, I call these character strengths. It's from my world of my graduate work in, in uh, positive psychology. So humor is a, is a character strength and mm -hmm. it absolutely increases, uh, you know, our, the quality of our life, but not only for yourself, but also, you know, for others, unless it's like inappropriate, like, you know, don't, don't be so funny if it, you know, if someone is really in terrible grief and you just, just be there with them. But for the most part, uh, not only does it, um, does it increase the quality of our life, but it has an enormous effect on our immune system and the chemicals that we bring out. And we talked about those character strengths like humor and positivity um, and your love of, of, uh, of, of beauty and, and dressing in a way that you, that regardless that you, that you felt uh, full of life by, by what, you, by what you wore. So I'm going to ask you a last question before we open it up to questions. So Wendy, I hope this question is not too pot, uh, complex, but it's, to the Wendy that's five years out from this diagnosis, um, what would you, what suggestions or advice, um, how would you talk to the Wendy and to all, to people who may be still in the process of getting treatments or may have been recently diagnosed, what would you say to them that, um, that you would love to share because you think it would really be helpful and would have been helpful and was helpful, would have been helpful to you when you first got diagnosed? I think that what I said earlier, that someone, people survive this and to assume that you're one of the ones that's going to do that. If it is your goal to live and thrive then to assume that position, assume the stance of wellness. That's what I would call it. Now, does that mean you're going to live for 20 years, 30 years, 12 minutes? I have no idea. But I don't think thinking that way can hurt you at all. And I only believe it can help you. Beautiful. So that's what I would say. And um, you can always worry later. I would say worry later rather than today. How are you right this minute? Going through COVID even, I say to a lot of people, how are you this minute? How are you this hour? Because things change. So just to stay as present as you can with yourself in this moment. Um, surround yourself with the best people you can and don't worry about insulting or hurting anybody's feelings as you go through this process by not including them because this is your chance to, I hate this word, I rarely use it, but to fight for your life. So uh, it's your life, it's the only one you have and you want to keep it vibrant as long as you can. So do all that you can to create that environment. So Wendy, I just want to thank you from the bottom of my heart for making that call and for choosing me to be your guide uh, on that extraordinary journey of getting well again. Um, and I, I just love that this is full circle that I found you on a webinar and here we are on a webinar together. This, I mean, you right. know, this is like, 
this is like you, you know, go to study guitar with a master guitar teacher and then you get to perform with them. That's what this feels like to me. Like I get right. to hang out like this. It's right. amazing. And um, we're doing and it on World Pan Pancreatic Day. So how? Yeah, national, royal. <laughs> right. <laughs> Pancreatic queen bees. Yeah. <laughs> okay. So Amy, I'm going to turn it back to you and, um, as far as questions. First of all, thank you both so much um, for opening up, being so personal and intimate with your experiences. Um, I know how much it's going to help others to hear. And I've consistently started writing down wonderful things and that you shared that's applicable to any of us, really. Um, we did get some questions in advance. Um, so uh, Mine, um, I don't know if you want to ask them yourself or if you'd prefer I, I Okay. Um, one question that she starts with, hello, lovely ladies, mm -hmm. um, is what are strict uh, diet no-nos uh, that you're able to stick to going forward? Great question. Um, so I would, first of all, get rid of the word strict no-nos and ask yourself <laughs> what it, and start with, with, let's always start with positivity. Um, the winning is uh, coaches in uh, in sports, um, they they say, okay, let's review what what happened today, and let, let's look at what we've done right and what we can do more of. So the the thing is to start with like, what are those foods that I'm either eating now or I could add to my diet that will absolutely uh, increase my chances of of you know getting well and staying well uh, for the rest for the rest of my life so we we don't have the time but the cruciferous, the cruciferous vegetables and you know fruits and vegetables and then and then there's a lot of variations right um and then also well are there some foods that are going to undermine my vision of of getting well um and there are some um I like to make it very simple. I mean, there's so many different ideas around this, but to eliminate or reduce sugar as much as possible. And the other thing is to stay away or limit the amount of white products you have, whether it's white bread or, you know, go for the sweet potatoes as opposed to the, uh, as, to, as opposed to the, the white pot potatoes. Um, but going back to what I said to Wendy, I mean, it's also the power of using your mind. So when I drink, I mean, I'm, you know, I'm 21 years out, but I'm also BRCA positive. So I'm high risk for uh, breast and ovarian cancer. Um, so when I have that green tea, I drink a lot of green tea and blueberries, all these very high in antioxidants. I, I, I eat them and drink it mindfully. And I, as I'm eating it, I'm saying that I can just feel how this is keeping my body healthy or healing my body. Um, and, uh, so that's a short answer yeah. to your question. I hope it's healthy, but just love what you're doing and love yourself for the effort that, that, that you're making. Just do uh, not beat yourself up for having that, you know, that chocolate chip ice cream or that chocolate chip cookie. That does far more harm what you're doing to your body by, you know, by beating yourself up uh, than than a whole than a whole bag of chocolate chip cookies. I agree. I wanted to say um, that I had to be open to a new way of eating when I got sick because I had a very healthy diet and included a lot of raw vegetables, like a lot of um, salads. You know, I live in California and fresh salads at least twice a day. And uh, initially, my body wasn't able to do to digest those mm -hmm. kinds of foods. Mm -hmm. So it had to become cooked vegetables. It had become soups, um, a lot of organic eggs, um, high quality protein. I was told, and I really adhered to this, that in order to counter affect the negative um, 
parts of the toxicity of the chemo, I needed a fair amount of clean animal protein to help support my system. 70 grams a day was what I was told. So that was a lot of eggs. I did that a lot. Um, then a lot of times I didn't have an appetite because of the chemo. Uh, mm -hmm. And my friends were always like my dealers and they were always trying to convince me to drink smoothies. And I just didn't, I didn't really do well with eating cold things. It hurt because of the, uh, and a lot of you may experience this, that certain things hurt your teeth because it's too cold because of the chemo. So um, you just, it's a, it's a constant game of self-love with your food on a daily and hourly and meal to meal basis. And I love what you just said, Marissa, about, you know, eating it mindfully. You know, I'm taking this in because this is helping me get stronger. This is fuel to continue to grow my body's strength back. And I thought about it that way. And I, I still think about it that way. Right. Right. And uh, a second question, um, how do you pick yourself up from the dark place um, of when or if uh, it creeps up on you again? So you should go to my website, <laughs> www.marissaharris.com, uh, because um, not all, uh, but the majority of the people I work with, like me, uh, at times had uh, a lot of had, had dark times and fear, doubt, and worry uh, came in. So the most important thing is to not make it wrong. Not, you know, we live in this world that we're supposed, you know, positivity absolutely, how positively engages our energy and helps us move forward. Um, but there's also a place for, uh, I mean, they use the word negativity, for fear and doubt and worry. We're, we're human um, and it's a place for, for for learning, I mean, to just examine, like when you're in that dark place, to really have a conversation with it and to allow that fearful or dark part of yourself and give it a name other than it owns. So for me, it was I, my mother-in-law, Fanny, was, well, so was my mother, was a constant worrier and had lots of fears. So I would call that part of me fearful Fanny. And, uh, and I would allow her to tell me every single thing that she was afraid of. And ultimately she'd even get to that, that, that sentence that I didn't want to say, that I'm afraid I'm going to die, that, you know, that this is not going to get better. And just, you know, the way you would, if your puppy was hurting or your child was hurting or your best friend, you don't want to say to them, don't feel that way. Um, that's not going to make it go away. So when you're in that dark place, you know, call someone who will just love you and console you and just say, oh, well, you know, you're going through a tough time. This is not easy. And just allow her to get it out. Best thing to do is even have her, you know, you write down everything that that part of you is afraid of. Um, and then, and then when you're ready, you bring in what I would call, I call her faithful Fiona, who's, uh, who, who, who just, you know, says, hey, we've been through challenging times, you know, and, and we've, you know, and, and what you're grateful for, what's, what's the good that's come out of this? Maybe you're just being able to, I mean, I know this was true with Wendy and so many others, to just really let go of a lot of that stuff that, you know, you were sort of making yourself feel like you should be doing this and you should be feeling that. And somehow when we get this uh, diagnosis, we're able to let some of those things go. Um, and, uh, you know, and know that it will pass. Yeah. Um, uh, two, two other written I, I, questions. I, I, I'm sorry, Wendy, go ahead. No, thanks. I, I two things that I wrote down while your question came up. Have you all heard this expression? Um, we are human beings, not human doings. Mm -hmm. So this notion that every single day is supposed to be the same or every single day will be sparkly in the same way is ridiculous. And um, I had to learn this as an artist and as an entrepreneur, but I think it totally applies when it comes to dealing with cancer or any kind of challenging situation, that it is not appropriate for me to think that I should have the same level of energy and intensity and um, 
accomplishment in any given day. There was a real rhythm to the chemo process. And there were three days of medicine, three days that I call, I go in the rabbit hole, and then I come back to life. And then I'd have a week to recover, and then we do the whole process again. Yeah. So I had to allow for that. The other thing I want to say is that I would self-talk to the littlest part of myself, what I call little Wendy. And I would literally, I mean, I remember being in the bathroom, sitting on the toilet, going, you're so great. I'm so proud of you. You're doing so great in your life right now. I mean, it would look ridiculous to anybody else. I would stand in the shower or I would sit in the tub and I would just let the water run on me. And I would say, I'm out loud. I would say, I'm so happy that you are alive another day and that you're doing great and we're making it through. And, oh, we have four chemos behind us. We only had eight more to go. I would have to talk to myself like this. That's what got me through. So that's how I would answer that to, to know that when it's dark to, to remind yourself that it's not always going to be like this and uh, find the littlest thing to congratulate yourself for. Yeah. Okay, and uh, Eve, your question was, um, I, uh, I was diagnosed with pancreatic cancer in June 2020. I'm currently undergoing chemotherapy. I get super hungry every two hours, uh, so I eat small, frequent meals, um, and the need to eat uh, continues through the night. Uh, very often, I have trouble digesting. Uh, it just sits in my stomach for several hours, or I feel pressure in the chest. Is there anything you recommend for alleviating this indigestion? Mm. Well, from a, a sort of a medical, you know, there, there's a couple of ways of, of doing it. Number one, uh, it's, uh, you know, they say you should, after six o'clock, particularly people who are going through any kind of digestive issues, that you should stop eating. But to just say, you know, I'm going to stop eating because when you're prone you're just much more likely to feel the indigestion and the nausea. But for those of us who get hungry more at night than in anything else, um, so what I, and I did see this message, so I actually brought it out. Uh, well, I guess what I, what I wanna say is make sure before you do anything, you check with your doctor. But this really, it's non-prescription, it's called Mastic Gum, M-A-S-T-I-C, I keep on, yeah, Mastic Gum, and it's by Nutri, Nutri Ecology. Um, it is really, uh, it's, uh, for me, it's because uh, I still have digestive uh, issues. Um, it really helps a lot. Um, but again, before you take anything, if you're doing treatment, you do want to check with a, with a doctor. I'm oh, and sure. I see from Hirschberg Foundation to Eve, here's more information on Mastic Gun. Good, 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 good. Um, I was curious about whether or not the person who asked the question was taking any kind of digestive enzymes. I take Creon. The only real medicine I've had to take post-cancer uh, has been um, the Creon. The, the, you know, it's a diagnosed, meaning it's a prescribed level. I take it with every meal. Uh, it helps me digest. And I took it before I had the surgery. I took it at the very beginning of my, my treatment and I've been taking it the whole time. So I don't know if you're doing that, but uh, that's something to certainly consider and discuss with your doctor. And um, yeah, that's what I want to say about that. You know, the other thing having to do both, you know, with fear and worry and, uh, and digestive issues, it really works on anything. I don't know. I use it a lot on myself. I've used it a lot with, um, with, my, with my clients, but also with my daughters is EFT, which is also called tapping. Mm -hmm. And uh, it is extraordinarily helpful in terms of dealing with any and then physical symptoms as well as uh, um, mental symptoms, emotional uh, symptoms. And Nick Ortner, who wrote the book, The Tapping Solution and has that, he has uh, an array of, of, um, of videos where you can just tap along with him, whether it's for pain. The other thing, just going back, because worry, uh, you know, I'm, I'm 21 years out and, uh, you know, I feel something that doesn't go away overnight. And I think, ah, it's a die, you know, something's, you know, the cancer has reappeared in my uh, in my earlobe or whatever it, it it may be. It just it's, you know I didn't think that way before, but but boy, but I'm able to 
quieted much more so than I was when I was one year out or two years out or in the midst of getting treatment. Um, but, I, but also what's very common is before someone has their CT scan um, or their PET scan or you know whatever it may be. And one of the tools that's very effective is that we can postpone uh, worry. And often what I find is it's when it's six months out, there's often not as much worry as when, oh my gosh, in one week or in three days, I have that, that CT scan and what if. Um, and what I learned in, uh, well, <laughs> I was in my 30s when I was really getting into this, into this work, is that we can postpone worry. So that, for example, it's a Monday and I have on Friday my, my CAT scan. I'm just using it as an example. And I would say to myself, well, I'm going, since I don't, I, there's nothing I can do about it. Whatever I've done, I've already done, is that I'm not going to worry about it until the day that I'm going to get the, you know, I'll give myself permission after I have the CT scan. And in between the, the time, in between now and then, I'm going to think about, well, what are some things that I've done that have really helped me in terms of getting well again? And what are some things that I'm just so grateful for? You know, I'm grateful that I get to see the cherry blossoms in the spring. I was told I'd never have another spring or whatever it may be. But what that does is it eases the nervous system um, and it reduces the amount of stress and therefore the harmful, harmful chemicals. Yeah, I, it's great. I, I would say I, I'm, I'm technically, uh, I'm not a worrier. Uh, in fact, some people said you're sure you're Jewish because they're very connected. <laughs> and I am Jewish, but I'm not much of a worrier. So. Um, the reason I'm not is because I do what I can. It's like I'm a Jew boo. The Buddhist thing would be to stay in the moment and say, what am I worried about right now? Like, it's very much similar to what Marissa said, just another way to language it. I live in the moment as much as I can, and that alleviates that for me. Right. That helps a lot. That's all I'm going to say. Uh, Alyssa, we had a Facebook question, and then we'll unfortunately um, have to wrap things up. Yeah. yeah, we actually had um, a question on the chat um, and they write, I've kept my circle of support very small. I know info is getting out there, but my experience has been that some people, my closest friends, um, I shared the news with and began crying and telling me how sorry they were. I found this very disturbing. I told them that I was not able to speak with them unless they were positive. Guess what? Some could only text me, how are you after that? Is it okay that I'm not sharing because I find the reaction so disturbing? Yes. <laughs> Absolutely. And it goes back to, um, you know, you're being very clear that, uh, I want to surround myself with people who believe that I can't get well again. Um, because that, you know, when, when people are negative in, in any way, that has an impact on us. Words matter. Um, you know, and so that just good for you. Good for you. Um, who is Amy? What was, I mean, uh, what's the name? Said, who, what's the name of the person who asked that question? Um, it was Joanne and then um, Barbara second okay. did that sort so, of emotion. So I so, think it's one that's yes, really so, resonating with our group. Right. So, the, you know, beyond this diagnosis, but of course this is a fertile ground to practice it in, uh, someone who really feels that they, uh, that they love their life and that they're true to who they're being and that goes along with it, is someone who speaks up for their values and for what they want. And in a, you know, not in a yelling way, but this is what serves me right now. And this is, you know, and just to let these people know that at right now at this time, uh, you're, you know, uh, you want people in your life who can share in that belief that you're doing well and that you will continue to do well. And, you know, just in terms of 
sort of convincing yourself, I know it's a little off this, but affirmations are very important. And so one of the things that has worked for many, many people and those people who have severe mental illness, so it's not just for physical illness, is that you just say, and this is what you communicate every day in every way, I am doing better and better. Now, in some ways you may not feel that way, but even when, you know, you can't lift your head up or, you know, you have the digestive, it's just, this is the way it's working it out every day in every way I am doing better and better. And that you ask people if they want to be right now in your life to feel the same way and support you in this. Uh, if, if we can just real quickly uh, answer Karen's question and then Aggie will uh, wind things up. Um, I'm curious, how long off uh, did you have uh, follow-up CT scans? Okay, <laughs> I don't think they would do this today, um, but for, uh, well, the, for the first couple of years, it was every eight weeks. Um, and I don't know what would have changed so much, but they said it's fast growing. Um, and then it was for years, like every four months um, until about, uh, talk about having a voice. Um, about 10 years ago, I said, nothing's changed. I mean, I, I still have a little bit of activity, but it doesn't, it doesn't seem to, it doesn't ever change. Um, and 10 years ago, I said, I'm not gonna do this anymore. I'm putting so much radiation into my, into my body. So, you know, I, I think it's different today than it was back then. I, I think they realize now much more. Um, but that's something that you need to uh, talk to your doctor about and see whether it makes sense, you know, how often you're, how often you're getting it. Um, you know, and there's also ultrasounds that you can do. I mean, there are other things, there are MRIs that are, that don't have that radioactivity. And I would say for me, since I'm still in the first five years and coming up to that milestone next year, um, right now I get tests every three to six months. Um, I will have my, I just had a checkup a week ago. I'll have another checkup in January and then one more in April. And then in May, I will be at five years. Um, and wow. yeah. And I do practice this notion of I'm doing this because it's helpful. And meaning if I couldn't wrap my brain around the idea that it was positive, I mm -hmm. wouldn't do it. If right. that makes any sense. So, uh, but yeah, but the main thing is if you have doctors that you trust, then you can have a real dialogue with them. You should never be afraid to talk to your doctor and ask questions. Or if you think you're a pain in the, in the butt, then you're not with the right people. That's how I feel. You gotta be able, willing to really partner with them on your recovery. Aggie. I, this was absolutely mm -hmm. wonderful, Marissa and, and uh, Wendy. Thank you again and uh, again and again. Um, my, mine and Eve, Eve, it's so nice to see faces. And, uh, and I, I missed you. I haven't seen you in a long time. So um, while both of you were speaking, I wrote, wrote down 10 points. Number one, optimist. Number two, positive attitude. Number three, solution. Number four, good news only. Number five, team of believers. Um, six, uh, committed, committed to feeling better. Seven, uh, permission to, to uh, have a life, to have my best life. And I, last, I don't know which one of you said this, uh, say to yourself, this is working. I'm, I'm in this, I'm working with the solution. How did I do? Good summary. Great summary. <laughs> um, from us, for the, from the Hirschberg Foundation, um, one of the first things I say, do not look at statistics. Statistics are yesterday's news. And if you do look, you know that you are in the percentage that is going to win. Yeah. Um, Amy and I also uh, uh, suggest connecting with a long-term long survivor friend um, that you can talk to daily. So a newly diagnosed person to, to meet and, 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 and talk with somebody that's eight, 10, 12 years out. And so certainly that gives, gives um, a lot of courage and positivity. 
Anyway, so today is World Pancreatic Cancer Day. My front lawn is being <laughs> uh, set up right now um, for um, a lot of flowers and, and a lot of activities. If any of you near live nearby, come on, uh, come on over. I think Amy, we're going to be here till about, about four. Two thirty. Two thirty. Okay. All right. Thank you, everyone, so much, and see you.